Hi, I'm Olivia F. Scott, the Assistant Professor of Advertising at Loyola University, New Orleans, and founder of Omerge Alliance's Marketing Consultancy. And you know, I've been practicing in marketing and advertising for a long time. And I feel that there is no more of a dynamic and interesting time in our industry than now. With all the new media platforms, there's so much to stay on top of, and sometimes more questions than answers. But one thing I know for sure from doing marketing since back in the 90s is that it's all about knowing your customer. If you know who your customer is, you can win. So we're going to talk today with Musa Hamden about how intimately knowing your customer sets you up to dominate. Musa is a man that I've long respected. He is self-made. He's a brilliant business mind, one of the most brilliant business minds I know. He's respected within the hip hop community, having started his own music label and is currently the longtime manager of Rapper Currency, along with other artists such as Fendi P, Isis, and Cobizzy. He's also produced films such as a mystery thriller, BB, which got nominated as a Best Independent Film at the Blood, Blood Guts UK Horror Awards in 2016, Revolver, and Jetflix. Outside of this, as if the, he has time for more, he also owns a rim and car care shop, New Orleans Street Customs Motors. Musa. Hey. How you doing? Amazing, amazing. Thanks is, for that, that amazing intro. It is such an honor to have you here with us today. Definitely. Thank you so much. It, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad you, you called me and asked me to come through. Uh, glad you made time. Definitely. I know you're busy. I appreciate this. Okay, let me get into it. So you have studied criminal justice. You also studied pharmaceutical law. Well, Tell I, us about this. I, I, I began fresh out of high school, went to Xavier University in New Orleans. Okay. And I was pursuing a PharmD degree. Okay. Uh, did my two years pre, and I did first year college of pharmacy. At which point, my my intentions was to do pharmaceutical law. Okay. Uh, wanted to get away from Xavier for a minute, so I said, "Well, let me go pursue the the law portion." So at that point, I went to Suno in New Orleans, Southern University of New Orleans, and I got a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. So now you're a mogul. You have a bachelor's degree in yep. criminal justice. Now you're a mogul. Can you just walk us through your journey to producing and managing talent? I mean, you have a lot of people who love you and look up to you. I'm sure they'd love to know more about the journey of the man. Definitely. Uh, I, I started, I think my first introduction into the actual real music business, not as a child, you know, everybody wanted to be a rapper and, and do all yes, that. Yes. I did all that. Okay. But my first year, I met a, uh, a artist, Dion Norman, uh, also was known as Devious D. Okay. He was also in his first year at Xavier. We okay. became friends. Uh, he invited me to the studio a couple of times where he was, record he was recording and signed to C Saint Studios, hmm. which was Alan Toussaint and Marshall Seahorn. Okay. Two pretty popular, famous people in, in New Orleans, and they had a record label. Um, he decided that he wanted to part ways from them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I want to get into the music business. So we formulated a record label. Um, I, I met an attorney by the name of Leonard Crooks, who was a uh, entertainment lawyer in New Orleans. And he helped us formulate this, this business. And we started Worth the Weight Recordings. Uh, and we had some moderate success. Yeah. Uh, but back then was the independent era where you really had to spend some money. You had to print your CDs and cassettes. We first started on cassettes, mm. CDs. You had to do the one stops. You had to actually travel America yes. and deliver this to one stops in hopes that people buy your music. What's one stop? One stop is basically when you're independent, mm -hmm. you would go like, there in, in Louisiana, there's Gonzalez one stop. Okay. You would go and consign maybe 500 cassettes to them. Okay. They would distribute them to all the mom and pop stores throughout Louisiana or their territory. Got it. Uh, but of course, they don't get to Memphis or they don't get to Chicago. So then you need to find out who is the one stop in that area. Oh, wow. Then you need to go there. Okay. And you also do a consignment. Now, mind you, you're printing 10,000 cassettes that nobody may ever buy. And you're going to these places and hoping that they'll push your product. You drop off two, three hundred, five hundred, 500, whatever they wish to do. Uh, you go to Chicago, which is home of the independent mom and pop record stores, where I think when we went there was over like 60 mom and pop record stores. You would go to each particular record store. 
and mm. ask them to carry 10 of your cassettes so that, like I said, in hopes that people buy. Back then was more of a music time, though, that people would buy new artists. Right. Uh, but it wasn't, no social media existed. Right. You know, it was, it was this is before uh, MySpace and, and uh, Black Planet and all that. No so bef- social networking, none nothing, of that. Nothing, yeah. nothing. We literally getting in a van and driving. So now you are running. You're the president of Jet Life Recordings yes. and Jet Life Apparel. Yes. Clearly, what I want to stop and say is you've done the work. So much love to you because you're telling us what you used to do with the Definitely. cassettes back in the right? So now you're here. How did you evolve from worth the weight to Jet Life Recordings and Apparel? So, yeah, I, I, put, I put in the hard labor. Yes, you did. Um, I had an artist on worth the weight at the time was named Anti Fiend. Okay. Uh, Antifine became Fiend of No Limit Records. Okay. Uh, when he left from Worth the Wait and he had an opportunity to go elsewhere, that may have been a bigger deal for him. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, being that I was in the music, all the local people I knew, KLC, who, was a, who became a, a huge producer, credited for over 76 million records sold, uh, produced the, some of the biggest hits on No Limit Records in their, their heyday. So uh, I knew him personally as a good friend because we worked with him as independents. Mm -hmm. So when Fiend went and signed to No Limit, uh, he did his thing there, and a few years later he decided he wanted to part ways. He called me and was like, look, I need you to come and be my manager. At that point, I said I never was a manager. I always just ran the business part. I'm like, I'm down. So I kind of helped him with his career, and, and, and I learned and, and off each other. We traveled mm-hmm. together and learned. And then at that point, um, me and him steadily grow, and I met Currency. Okay. Currency used to come to my car shop. He was also signed to No Limit. Well, he was signed to the new No Limit, okay. which was 504 Boys. This was after Fiend and Mia X and, okay. and everybody left No Limit. He came to the car shop needing a tire or whatever, and we talked. And I knew his brother because his brother was signed to me at Worth the Weight. Okay. So when he signed to Cash Money, Young Money, Lil Wayne's label, he called me and was like, I want you to be my manager. Hmm. So I'm like, all right, you know, I'm down. So, you know, got together. I already had a relationship with Lil Wayne from the car shop because I used to work on his cars there too. So I flew out and start becoming his manager at that time. And he told me uh, he felt that he wanted me as his manager because anybody who could bring Listen up. the Rough Riders and DMX to the Magnolia Projects mm. could pretty much do anything is what he felt. Because he was a child, 12, 13 years old, 14 years old, living up there hanging on the steps. Fiend had traveled from No Limit end up signing with Rough Rider Records. I had a relationship with D&Y, who were the owners of Rough Rider Records. So they was coming to New Orleans for the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. just to, because record labels always go to big events, of course, to show their face. DMX being the biggest artist over there, they had Eve, everybody, yeah. Jada Kiss, everybody was down here. Mm-hmm. So being that we already had a great relationship, they wanted me to bring them around the city. Okay. So the city I know is the hood. I can't really bring you to parts that are not going to appreciate what you do. Right. So I brought them to, to the Magnolia. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, they blocked mm-hmm. off a, a courtway over there and, and did some donuts and some wheelies. And, you know, the kids loved it. And, you know, we rolled down Canal and just did all the, all the Rough Rider stuff that you see in the videos. Right. We kind of brought it to New Orleans. Okay. You know. So um, at that point, Currency was like, seeing you do that, I really wanted you to manage me. So me and him started doing that with Young Money, Cash Money. And then he decided that that wasn't really his niche. Okay. He was like, the music is cool. I love Lil Wayne. I love Mac Man. I love all of them over there. But they're rapping about stuff that I've never done. And they're getting on a song saying this, that, and whatever. And I'm talking about riding skateboards and smoking weed. And right. That's probably, it's not matching. Okay. So he's like, I just, I just want to do my own thing. At which point he decided to leave. 
and we first started uh, uh, FS Jets, which was Fly Society, okay. which was with Terry Kennedy, a skateboarder out of L.A. Okay. He was signed to the ice cream uh, skateboard team. Okay. So that didn't work out too well. We left from Fly Society, and we did FS Jets. That just didn't really sound good. And it was like, well, Jet Life, that sounds better. Hmm. So we went with Jet Life, which is Just Enjoy This Life. It's hmm. an acronym. Or Jets yeah. is Just Enjoy This Shit. Okay. So it's just enjoying life. It's the life that we wanted. You know, Ultimately, that's where we went at. So it's interesting because when you talk about going to the Magnolia Projects, yes. right, and creating this experience, I mean, I'm going to call it an experience, the Rough yeah. Riders, right? This is about knowing the audience that yes. was there and taking Definitely. something relevant to them, not going to another neighborhood where they wouldn't right. be respected or honored, right. right? So when I look at the brand you've built with Jet Life, and I'm so in awe of it, can you tell us, you know, what steps have you taken to truly know your audience? I went to the Jet Lounge event you had at the House yes. of Blues, and I was like, this is a whole nother universe of young people that I would not, I, that's just not my world. But I thought it was so fascinating because it was very obvious that you curated an event that was for a specific group of people and that they were showing you loyalty, affinity and they were having incredible good times. So can you tell us how you how you've really grown to specifically find an audience and then get to know them? How do you do that? I mean the biggest thing is is like you said is knowing the audience. It mm -hmm. is knowing um, who your consumer is. Mm -hmm. uh, who who wants your product, who enjoys your product. Of course, you could try and sell your product to everybody, to a vast majority of people, and you'll spend way more money trying to market your business to this vast amount of people that don't want your product at right. all. Right. So our music was more of a late, when we started Jet Life, Currency's main vibe was, was laid back, um, stoner music, as well as rapping about truth. He prides himself on rapping about what he knows about. And so who was your audience, Musa, with uh, that? The, the audience was, our audience started as first in, in L.A. is bigger the stoner crowd. Okay. Which was more of the, the, the younger hippies of America today. You okay. know, the, the skateboard kids, exactly what he did. He skateboarded. So the skateboard kids. And, and we, we look at, of course, what kind of music they like. What do you, what do you want to hear, you know? Most people that is in the stoner crowd, they're not ready. They don't want the big, big sounds in their ears because they're they're feeling good. They're they want to hear something that's more melodic, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And that's just what this what he rapped about in the in the production that he chose was that type of thing, something that you will enjoy hearing. And and like I said, the other thing was just uh, curate curating the music to that crowd mm -hmm. in in rapping truth he never wanted to rap about things that that he don't have mm -hmm. you know videos would be cars that he owns he don't want to rent a car mm -hmm. so in the crowd that we noticed love that they love the fact that he basically rapped about stuff that they could touch so Versus he, aspirational things they right. could never get access to. He didn't to. rap about Gucci's and just he didn't rap about a, a Rolls Royce Cullinan before he owned one. Okay. He rapped about a Monte Carlo, because that's what he could afford at that time. Nice. He took his first nice. check, gave it to me, and was like, "I see this Monte Carlo on eBay. I want it." It was fifty five hundred dollars. I said, "Cool. We just made a check for six thousand dollars. Let's spend <laughs> it all, bro. Let's just spend it all." So we okay. went. I bought this Monte Carlo in, in Houston and drove it back to New Orleans, mm -hmm. you know, so didn't know if it was going to break down or not. Right. Just said, let me just drive this 1986 <laughs> Monte Carlo. And everybody, just the, the fans loved it. And so when we saw that, they, that they was appreciating that. Of course, rather than trying to go left, we went straight ahead. We're going to keep doing what you like as long as we keep seeing the growth in it. That's what I was going to ask you. So there are rewards when yes. you really get to know an audience, deliver for them. How have you been rewarded with Jet Life as a company? I know you've expanded. I think so we've, we've been rewarded first from the fans because we was able to create 
a hardcore fan base. Okay. The biggest thing to do is when you when you build a consumer base that appreciates, loves, respects, and supports your product, that's the, the best thing ever. Period. Because they're going to buy whatever you sell because they know that they're first going to get quality. Mm-hmm. They're going to they're going to get the respect uh, as as a consumer. Mm-hmm. They're they're getting exactly what they want. It's what they've been built on. Nothing has changed. So when we when we did the music, of course, they knew what they was getting. They knew the vibe that they was getting. So it's just like anybody else, anybody other other artists who may have a fan base. They appreciate that. The problem with some artists that I see is are your fans appreciating you as an artist or the sound that you're creating? Okay. Because if they're just appreciating the sound, because some new artists that I hear is, I'll hear it and I'm not, I don't know what artist that is because he sounds like another artist. Right. So I'm not 100% sure. It's no disrespect. It's right. just a sound right. that has been created in a younger generation now. Huh. So there's more of what they consider, not necessarily everybody's a one-hit wonder, right. but everybody's chasing this one sound. It's like disco. It's like a, it's a sound. Yeah. That people are into. We carved the lane. Mm. It's our sound. Mm. Uh, our apparel side, we I took notice when we was from the music on tour. Mm-hmm. We started just selling what we consider tour merch. Okay. Tour merch is merch that that basically says currency. Uh, the whatever tour these are the cities we're going to mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and i was like they're really going crazy behind this they're really starting to they really spending a lot of money buying these t-shirts memorabilia so i was like well mm. i want to see this grow more because i want to be able to wear jet life to anywhere i go mm-hmm. i never want to have to go to louis vuitton to get a dress shirt right right i want to be able to wear jet life so let me make a dress shirt. Mm-hmm. I have the manufacturing skills. Mm-hmm. I have the, the manufacturers that I can use. And I know what I want. Mm-hmm. So th- at that point, we created the apparel side of it, not the tour merch. Of course, we had to change the word to apparel to let people know it's a little more well-respected. Yes, than it, tour merch. This is not, this not Jet Life merch. Right. Because merch sounds like merch. It's like, oh, okay, it's merchandise. Positioning. Yeah, so language. no, we're not doing that. It's apparel. Okay. This is not merch. I tell people that when you say, no, 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 we don't. We sell merch, but that's on tour. Lucy, you know I could talk to you forever. Yes, you yeah. know this, right? Definitely. But I'm going to ask a couple more questions yes, here. Yes, let's go. So, you know, Loyola has a very respected music school as well. Yes. A lot of really great students are here. And I hear you saying over and over that you guys are very strategic about choosing an audience and choosing to serve. A lot of young people, a lot of musicians, just like, everybody's going to like music. Everybody's. What would you say to a young musician who says, I want everyone to love my music? What would you say to that? Sounds amazing. I do too. But the, the, the thing is, you know, uh, a saying I heard a long time ago, you cannot please everyone all of the time. And so what would you recommend they so do? Mm-hmm. I feel like with us, like, you know, we've said that, like, we chose the audience. In all honesty, I feel the audience chose us. I, I knew you were going to say that. I so when that audience chose us, yeah. we chose them back. Rather than saying, oh, we don't want you. Yes. I want you. I can't have you. Ooh. I want I want who wants me. Right. You enjoy what I'm doing. Right. And I enjoy what I'm doing. Right. So why not do it more and market it to you? Because I know you're the one who enjoys it. Love because the one you're you the with. one who's going to support me. Yep. When I, when I go on mm. tour, when I put out music, you're the one who's going to come to me. Rather than me keep trying to sell it. Yeah. To someone that doesn't really want it. I'd rather put it in the consumer hand and let them sell it. Powerful. So a couple of more things. Secret sauce. Musa, what's your secret sauce to the, being successful? De- determination. Uh, success. I think I, t- I tell people, like, I, I grow on success, not materialistic things. I, I, of course, I, I want the finer cars. I want the jewelry. I want all that. Mm-hmm. But my mind has always been set to see growth 
as well as a success story. Hmm. I want to be written about. Hmm. Not for saying, oh, he had this and he had that. I'd rather be talked about in the sense of he did this hmm. and he did that. And he's helped this and he's changed this. I love New Orleans. I love the New Orleans market. I want to see New Orleans grow. Mm -hmm. So I always try and do things to help New Orleans music uh, and, and New Orleans uh, culture grow and expand to outside of New Orleans and all over the world. Everywhere I've traveled, people everywhere love New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people run away from our own culture. Why run? Same thing. The people have chose you. Right. They chose New Orleans. They love it. They're here. So yeah. why run from that? Be who you are. Be who you was raised to be. So the secret is, I think, is just is, is sticking to, to whatever it is that you strive for, whatever it is that you appreciate, stick to it. Grow, grow with it, you know. Uh, why? Commit. Uh, definitely. Commit. Definitely commit mm -hmm. to it, you know. And that's my thing. Commitment is a big thing. I, I, I don't believe in losing. So I'm going to stick to it and push and push and push until I see growth. With that said, Musa Hamdan, president, Jet Life Recordings and Jet Life Apparel. He has dropped some gems with us today. Thank you so much, Musa. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I Definitely. could go on and on and on. But everybody, think about your customer proposition. I'm going to say it over and over again. I hear it all the time. I've been doing marketing again for almost 30 years. And I find people always want to reach everyone or the most desirable audience of 18 to 24-year-olds or 25 to 49-year-old women. And what I know for sure is that for every compelling proposition that offers something true, of authenticity, there is an audience for you. So I look forward to seeing you on a future Behind the Ad. Thanks for joining us today.